So just uh, a quick introduction. So uh, Jung and I are part of the Innovative Software and Data Analysis Group here at NCSA, um, which is a team of 20 plus full-time staff that work on research and development. So um, we're very much on the software side of things. Um, and uh, more in particular, we work on frameworks for data management and data analytics. Um, we have a variety of projects that we work on. Some are very small and short term. Um, some are, you know, uh, five years and larger uh, collaborative efforts. Um, and so because of that, many times what we try to do is we try to find ways to create frameworks to kind of uh, simplify our life in a way across different projects and uh, meet the requirements of the individual projects. So we work with a variety of domains. Um, these are just some of them. Uh, I wanted to put this slide up here because today we're going to very much focus on uh, uh, geographical information systems and geospatial data. Um, but a lot of the tools that we build are work across different domains, and uh, we'll mention one, Clouder, that uh, is one of those that really can kind of span all of these domains. So, uh, more specifically, the, what is the problem statement that we're going to look at today is, you know, there's this deluge of data streaming from instruments and sensors, we're all aware of that. Uh, some of the main challenges are that the data is heterogeneous, um, it's in many times high volume. Um, it's accessible in different ways, so how you go and get that data from different sources varies quite a bit. And if we look at some of the solutions that try to kind of take, um, um, you know, solve this problem, uh, many times they're very specific to the data um, uh, in particular. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to tackle is this idea of how do we aggregate uh, data from different sources and uh, how do we make it easy for the end user uh, to basically inspect and make sense of this data from different sources. So, um, more specifically, we started some of this work, uh, I think about six years ago, maybe it's a little bit more than that. Uh, we started with a project called GreatLakesMonitoring.org. Uh, um, the task at the time, and this is a still an ongoing project, uh, was to provide access to environmental monitoring data collect, collected throughout the Great Lakes. Um, you know, the Great Lakes are a very large body of fresh, you know, uh, water uh, between Canada and the U.S. Uh, this is a project that um, um, we have been working uh, with the Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the uh, Great Lakes National Program Office. And at the time, kind of the, the goal was, okay, we have all this data, but um, it's in all sorts of different places, so we don't have really a single entry point into this data space. Um, and for certain data, uh, that was not even online. So it was very hard to get to uh, this data. So they asked us, can you create some kind of portal to access the data to, ask, to aggregate this data? And so to give you more specifically what this data kind of uh, is, um, here's a list on the left of the kind of uh, data sources that we have, uh, mostly from EPA, some from uh, USGS, uh, some from uh, university labs. Um, so uh, we have nutrient data, contaminants, uh, sensor data, river discharge, um, uh, zooplankton data, uh, small organisms in the water. And if you look on the right, there's some pictures of uh, these are actually vessels that the EPA owns, and they go out uh, into the lakes um, um, uh, several times a year, and uh, they have these sensors that they drop down the water column. Uh, that's what you see there on the right. Uh, they get water samples. These water samples go back to the lab, and so you get all sorts of information um, uh, and that's kind of mainly the sensor data and nutrients. Um, uh, down below, you see a fish. Uh, they also take contaminants out of fish. Uh, so in many locations, they go there. They find fish, some dead, some not. Then they bring it back to the lab, and they analyze it for certain contaminants. Um, and the bottom right, that's just uh, a USGS river gauge. Uh, in some of the rivers that, you know, end up in the Great Lakes. So as you can see, there is a variety of data sources, a variety of parameters, right, that they wanted to bring together in one place. Uh, later on, um, we, we, we started another project. So while that was funded by uh, EPA, uh, this one was funded by the National Science Foundation, U.S. National Science Foundation, 
this is called the Intensely Managed Landscape Critical Zone Observatory. So this is a program at NSF uh, where they've been finding uh, about uh, 10 different uh, critical zone observatories across the U.S. And uh, um, they, um, in this particular case, uh, the goal was to understand short-term and long-term resilience um, of basically the critical zone in uh, areas in the Midwest of the United States. And the critical zone they defined from the atmosphere down to the soil and the ground, right? So the goal here was and is to bring uh, multiple researchers from different disciplines to work on problems that span, right, that entire critical zone instead of focusing on one particular aspect of the critical zone. And one of the exciting things for us, we you know, are doing the data management for them, uh, is that um, they actually have quite a bit of sensors and experiments that they put in the field. Um, so the challenge here was not just to aggregate data from different sources, but actually we are the only place that kind of stores this information and we get it directly from the sensor in the fields. Um, so there are you know, inherent challenges there as well, um, uh, unique to this use case. And then the third use case that I'm going to, oh, and so here's a list of, you know, some of the data that we have for IMLCZO. Um, on the right, uh, you'll see that's a flux tower. So you get some information, atmospheric information uh, from that. Uh, so these are, you know, that tower was set up by the researchers from the universities. Um, and um, on the left, you have this long list. This is only a subset of the data. Um, but there is data about the soil, stream flow, atmospheric. And so the, the, the kind of challenge here is, again, you get all this data. How do you kind of uh, bring it all together in one place so it's easier for the users to kind of find what they're looking for, aggregate it, and then eventually do you know, analytics on it? Um, and, and then the third case um, that we're going to kind of uh, used to drive this conversation is the Great Lakes to Gold Virtual Observatory. Uh, this is another one that um, uh, it's kind of uh, interesting because they have all these sources. This is actually a lot of sources. So if you look at these maps, uh, the numbers there represents the sites that we have data from. Um, so, if, you know, those are clusters where some of them, like in the area of Chicago, there's 583 uh, different sites, 290. Um, so there's a lot of sites for this one. They go down the Mississippi because the main questions that the researchers are trying to answer in this case is how nutrient in water kind of affects hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. So the Mississippi, right, cuts kind of the United States, you know, in, in half, top to bottom. Um, and down at the bottom in the Gulf of Mexico, um, there is hypoxia issues where there's lacks of oxygen in the water and fishes, you know, are dying. There's, you know, entire dead zones. Um, and so, um, you know, there's all sort of research that goes into trying to understand how the extra nutrients going down the Mississippi affect that. Um, so the goal of this virtual observatory is to bring all this data along the Mississippi together in one place. This is also an interesting one because we started, this is a partnership, this, is a, uh, this work is funded by the Walton Family Foundation, so it's a private foundation. Uh, it's a collaboration with universities here in the area. And um, the nice thing about it is that while it started by, you know, creating the site for the entire Mississippi River, right now we're talking to individual states that have mandates. And so in the case of Illinois, we also have a standalone site uh, for this Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy that is a EPA Illinois for the state of Illinois effort. Uh, so the states are trying to, starting to pay attention you know, and they kind of want their own uh, space, data space for their, you know, uh, data relevant to their state. Um, in this case, again, uh, we got sensors all along the Mississippi. We also have a lot of geospatial layers, so shapefile, geotiff, raster, right, uh, geospatial uh, data. Um, we, uh, the parameters there on the left are some of the parameters that uh, we track. Uh, we also have these Grion buoys along the Mississippi. The project itself manages some of them. Um, so we have data loggers where we get the data directly from the buoy every hour. Um, and then, you know, we kind of stream it into the system as it comes. So, um, you know, these are kind of the three main projects that have driven some of this development. Um, but at the end, for most of the, you know, what does the data really look like? Most of the time, not always, but most of the time, as you probably all know, it looks like CSV files with a bunch of information in them. And as you probably know, you know, CSV is, is a very lax format. Um, there isn't really a very fixed structure to it. 
Um, so for example, here's another CSV file, but what you see at the top is a very long header with a lot of very important metadata. And then down below, you see these tab delimited values. Um, they're actually flipped on their axis. Uh, sometimes in the case of USGS, you get XML back, right? So the format of this data varies a lot, uh, but many times, right, what's embedded within these files is, you know, similar uh, parameters and measurements or things that are compatible that should be kind of, uh, can be looked at across the different data sources. So our proposed solution has been, and you know, this has been both the research and development project, we've been trying things along the way, learning things, is some kind of framework that allows us to first and foremost uh, deal with raw files, right? We got these raw files, before we do anything with them, we gotta make sure we don't lose them. Um, then we're saying, well, now how do we kind of look across all of them, right? Well, you have to get that information out of these raw files into some kind of optimized spatial temporal database. Um, and uh, third, we really want, you know, web service API because we want to create clients both in terms of putting data in as well as taking it out, you know, that are easy to write, to develop. Um, so, um, uh, furthermore, there's a heavy emphasis on visualization, right? This is one of those things where the goal here is to, once you have it all together, make it easy for uh, researchers that are interested in this information to find what they're looking for. And that usually, right, deals with visualizing this information. So this is a high level architecture. I'm gonna talk about these pieces specifically um, uh, uh, one at a time. I'm gonna start, so, so but, but overall, this is kind of you know, uh, our, our framework. So on the left, you see kind of the different data sources. You have external data sources such as USGS. We don't maintain that data, but we wanna bring it into the system so that it's next to the data that we maintain, right? Um, down below, we have data loggers, right? We have access to the sensors themselves, our modem, they send data over, and we want that data to end up in, within the system. And then we have manual upload. Many times, uh, whether it's lab analysis or people going in the field, right, and filling out spreadsheets, uh, doing experiments in, you know, different formats, you know, these are kind of the three major modes in which we get this data. And then what we do is we write uh, in the first two cases what we call data parsers, which are very specific to the data source. Um, I'll talk about what these, how we write the data parsers in, in, in a, um, later on. Um, but one of the things that uh, I wanna highlight is that um, depending on the data source, these data parsers can do very different things. And in the end, they end up putting this information in really two main systems. At the top, you've got this GeoStreams web service kind of uh, service that on top of it, so that's a RESTful web service. On top of it, you have, um, which is our kind of GeoStreamings database, right? That's where the parse data points, the, the data that has been cleaned, has been put in a normalized kind of format, ends up uh, living in. Uh, on top of that, we have this Geo dashboard, which is the kind of visualization kind of search, uh, you know, for this information, look at the entire system uh, in a kind of geospatial fashion. On the bottom, we have this clouder uh, data management system, which primarily deals with the raw files. So, and stores the raw files along with a bunch of metadata. So really what this picture is trying to say is that, depending on how the data from the left comes in, these data parsers do different things. Sometimes uh, they will simply get the data and put it in this geostreaming web service, right? and then it will appear on this geo dashboard. Sometimes it will just take these raw files. Uh, for example, we have geo tiffs that just end up in Clouder. They don't end up on the geo dashboard. Uh, we have LiDAR data, for example, that you know, it's very, um, very big, very large, and we just store it in Clouder. We don't show it on the geo dashboard. Other times they do both. Sometimes they go in Clouder first, and then they end up in the geo dashboard and so on. So that's the big picture. So I'm gonna start with the geo dashboard. I'm gonna then talk briefly about the data parsers, then I'm gonna switch to this clouder data management system. Um, so these are some simple data counts. Um, they might not look very impressive, um, but remember this is very heterogeneous data. Um, so I'll talk about how we categorize and kind of represent sensors and streams, um, but uh, data points is one of those things where if you think about those CSV files, those, um, you know, uh, each data point is really a row in the CSV file. 
I'll talk about what the data point really looks like in a second. But so what that means is that that's, these numbers are not individual measurements. There are multiple measurements at one location uh, at one time. Um, there is raw files and bytes. And the reason why we put that there is because we want to emphasize how in certain use cases, we're able to get a lot more data points out, right, in this normalized fashion. But maybe we don't have a lot of raw files that this data comes from. In other use cases, we have less, you know, data points. For example, Great Lakes to Golf has 22 millions of these data uh, points. IMLCZO and Great Lakes Monitoring around 5 million. But on the flip side, IMLCZO has 2.6 terabytes of data. That's primarily LiDAR data and, and, and shape files. Um, so again, uh, you know, depending on the use case, you will end up uh, using, you know, you know, different pieces of the puzzle. Uh, more or less. So let's start at the top. Let's start at the geo dashboard. So here's an example of the explore page for one of the geo dashboards. So what we see, what you see is we have zoomed in to one particular location. Uh, that's what you see on the right. This is Grion uh, 01. Uh, we have some basic metadata about it: the location, the time range of what for uh, what we have data. So to 2015 to 2016, and then a list of parameters eight uh, that we tracked at this location. Um, on the left, what you see is a list of all the possible locations. It's this little color pills uh, for the entire uh, instance um, organized by data source. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a second. Uh, but the idea is that you can either go with the map and zoom in and find the site you want, or you can go on the left and pick the pill based on the data source and also on these magical numbers that are HUC numbers, which are basically watersheds defined by the USGS. Um, so this different ways to basically get to a particular site. Here's another example. Uh, in this one, we have different colors for the pills on the left. Um, and that means whether the site is online or offline, meaning we have historical data or we have data that is streaming in, uh, uh, you know, as we speak. Uh, this uh, shows different ways in which you can organize these pills. Uh, so even though one pill, one location, right, can show up in, in different of these columns, you can organize them by different, uh, kind of slice them by different dimensions. One is the data source. For example, uh, you know, in this case, uh, we have um, at the top atmospheric deposition station or by parameter, right? I want all the sites that have river discharge which could span different data sources, USGS and ISWS, or by categories, hydromet, stream water quality, stream flow, and so on. Again, to support the user in finding the data they're interested in. Uh, we also have support for shapefiles within the Geo dashboard. So here is, uh, we've zoomed out uh, uh, from the location we were looking at, the first one we looked at, and we have turned on a layer here on the left, and we're showing river reaches. Um, so uh, what we can see is the river reaches around the Mississippi River as defined by that geospatial layer. Here's another layer. This is total annual nitrogen for point sources uh, between 2007, 2014 with a legend on the left. And on the right, you see it uh, you know, sh shown there. Um, and the nice thing that what, what this gives you or the researcher is some context about the data that then you can look at at that specific location uh, over time. Uh, here's another example. This is IMLCZO. Um, the shape files that we're showing here, the layers that we're showing here are moraines, which are basically uh, uh, sediments uh, within the ground of glacial activity uh, within uh, Illinois in this case. Um, there, um, and also uh, what we're showing here is a digital elevation model in the area. Again, context for when looking at these different uh, locations, you get a context of the area surrounding it. So once you pick one of these uh, locations, now we go into what we call the detail page. So this is uh, down below close to in Louisiana, um, uh, close to New Orleans. Um, and what we see here is what we do is we try to visualize the data. Um, so we have uh, different parameters here on the left that we're visualizing uh, with uh, very simple time series graphs. Um, and also on the right, we have these box and whiskers uh, uh, um, graphs that show some quantiles information, some statistics about the data over time. So one of the things that uh, is interesting here, and let me show you the next one just as an example. Here's another site, different parameters, you know, 
uh, different numbers. Here we show lines interpolated. Uh, one of the first thing, you know, in our first naive implementation uh, was we showed the full range and we showed the raw data. Well, you know, in some cases, this full range can be decades and the data itself can be at, you know, 15 minute intervals. So obviously that does not scale in a web browser. Uh, so one of the first things that we had to implement was for visualization purposes, we actually have a binning mechanism uh, where depending on the date range at the top, uh, we basically uh, bin the values so that we can visualize them and send them to the client. Uh, this is primarily for the geo dashboard. If you go directly to the API, you can actually get the raw data, but it's kind of an interesting challenge on how you bin this information just for visualization purposes and how you kind of pick which bin you show and you stream down to the browser so that we really, what we like to show is the full range and then let the user zoom in down to the, you know, the, uh, you know, minute data uh, if available. Um, so what we do is, while the API is one common standard that I will show you in a second, one common format, um, at the same time, the visualizations can be very different. So uh, we saw time series, so we saw you know, different values over time at one location. Here is one location down the water column. I mentioned that at the beginning, um, different parameters down the water column. So what you see on the y-axis is the depth, and then what you see on the um, x-axis is the value of that parameter, and we have different x-axis uh, for the different parameters. And so you can look at how the values change down the water column, because uh, that's very in important for Grill X monitoring, because they're looking at stratification of the water down the water column. Here's, an, here's another example. Uh, this is just a, a stack graph. Uh, we're looking for every year on the x-axis uh, what um, is uh, the percentage of zooplankton? So these are little organisms in the water uh, biomass. So per meter cube, the quantity of these different um, organisms. Um, and there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Again, the, the representation from the API is still one representation, just different data. Um, also, the interesting thing in this case is that uh, as part of our data parsing here, we actually created these families on top of the raw data, but the raw data actually is for uh, much more narrow definitions of these organisms. So what you see here is these classes that we kind of created as part of the data parsing. But if you look at the raw data, you have a broader range. But again, this is for, you know, kind of an eye level overview, then you can get the raw data if you're actually doing, you know, analysis on it. This is another view where you can pick different sites and compare, you know, different parameters across those sites. Again, very, very much about, you know, visual inspection of this information before you download it for analysis. Um, this is a search page where uh, what we do um, is, and let me see, I think, let me start, I mean, let, let me skip that one. Here we go. So uh, here's the IMLCZO instance. Um, and when you start in the search page, what we do is we basically let the uh, user uh, pick how they want to drill down to find the information they're interested in. So by default, everything shows up um, and the locations kind of filter is available. Uh, then you can draw your area on the map or you can pick a predefined location. In this case, we're going to pick the Sangamon River. Uh, when you do that, it zooms in into that location that we have selected. And now what we're seeing is only things within that location, only, only sites within the location. And we can keep adding filters. So we can pick from a list of options in terms of filters. Uh, I've picked parameters here. And so now we can it only list the parameters available within that uh, selection, um, spatial selection. Now I can pick the parameters I'm interested in. And then, for example, I can keep going and saying, now I want to continue to filter by data source. So the data sources that we see here are data sources that are only available based on our previous filters. Eventually, you will get a perm at any time. You can pick a permalink or download the raw data. And now you have the raw data. You can send your permalink to one of your colleagues. So what we're trying to do, again, is help the user kind of filter down to the data that they really need. Uh, the dimension I'm not showing here is time. And so you can also pick time ranges and um, it's, uh, you can you know, get data only for a specific range. Um, so um, briefly, uh, this is what a data point looks like. Uh, it's JSON data. Um, this is how you put information in and how you get it out. Uh, it's GeoJSON. Um, so what you have here at the top is a start time and an end time. 
Uh, for the most part, uh, for us, these are the same, but the system actually supports start and end time. We have properties, which is just a flexible JSON document. You can put whatever you want in here. Uh, for the most part, these are uh, specific values, like your stage is full sample, but we also have uh, uh, provenance information, QIQC information, or anything else you want. Then down below, you have JSON, you have geometry type. Uh, so in this case, it's a point, but you can actually we support polygons um, if you want. So that's what a data point looks like. Beyond the scenes, we use Postgres for this just streaming API. Uh, this is, um, um, if you're not familiar with uh, relational databases, the interesting thing to take away about this is that if you look here at the column types, uh, we're doing kind of a hybrid between NoSQL and relational. Uh, we have the start time, end time, just simple timestamps. Then we have this data column, which is a JSON binary data column. That's how we support that kind of generic JSON uh, document. And then we have um, uh, at, up at the top this geography uh, column, which is the post-GIS column, which is the geospatial column that allows us to have points or polygons within that with those kind of indices on them. Um, there is not just data points. There's also data points are organized in streams, and streams are organized as in, in sensors and sites. This is what you would see if you talk to the API directly. This is what the Juice uh, dashboard kind of talks to. But if you want clients, our data parsers, for example, they post this information to the service. So it's very easy to support both pushing data in and getting it out in different clients. We also have query endpoints where you can say, within this geocode, since this type date and that date, this attributes, this is basically the endpoint that a search page uses, but you can write your own clients, download the data that you want. And we also, this is another example where we specify provenance information. So uh, how do we write parsers? Um, we primarily write them in Python. And uh, you know, originally we had basically anybody could write the parsers however they want, just write it in Python. Eventually we saw that that was a mess. Different developers would write them in different ways. So we started creating this Py geotemporal library that supports kind of you know, a, a, you know, a, a library to make these data parsers more consistent across the board. This has helped you know, in making the code more robust. Uh, new developers have an easier time using this and writing their own parsers. Um, but the latest thing that we're building and we're testing is actually a way in which you don't write Python code. You have YAML files, which are a form of JSON, just text files, and you basically configure the parsers. This doesn't work in all cases. It works in many cases, and it's very nice to maintain because now you just have the configuration for the parser. You don't have to write any code. So for version three, which is something that we're working on, we have rebuilt the front end. We're using uh, more modern technologies and uh, reformatting, kind of re-architecting how we're doing it. We're using React to, uh, JS, Redux, Open Layers version three to basically improve the user interface, but also make the system a lot easier to maintain. Uh, I've mentioned the binning technology, how we bin. Um, the way we did it before was, was quite a mess. Uh, we're using basic static files on disk. It was okay for the most part, but now we're building bins within the Postgres database, which makes it a lot easier to basically maintain and update over time. Um, so there's a lot of things coming with this uh, new uh, uh, release, um, and uh, some of it is already available. The new search page I showed already uses this version 3. Um, here is a kind of a mock-up uh, from one of our designers of the new Explore page. We have already implemented, uh, started implementing this, obviously, um, but uh, it still has a way to go. Um, this is actually um, a alpha version of the detail page with new graphs and some new capabilities and, and, and so on. So we're showing quantiles on the time series graph and improvements. Again, this is very rough still, uh, very much work in progress. Um, and one of the things that we're starting to do, which we didn't do in the dashboard before, is uh, have the ability of track users. So when they download data, we know what they downloaded. So if something changed, we do some QAQC, we can go back to them. If they're, you know, it's streaming data, they want to download using the same parameters. They don't have to do the query many times. You know, they can save the query. And also with version three, we're starting to support a, a mobile interface. So if you go to the dashboard from a mobile phone, uh, the interface is very, very different. It's built for smaller screens um, so that, you know, you can do that. You can do it from your phone. This was primarily a driver from uh, farmers who were working with IMLCCO and were landing the land for the sensors for the NSF project. And in return, they want to have access to this data in the field. 
and they have phones in the field. So now I'm going to switch drastically uh, for the last 10 minutes uh, to kind of how we manage raw files and metadata. I will probably skip some slides since we're already half an hour into the presentation. Um, but, um, you know, the, the first kind of uh, part of the presentation was very much about when you have the CSV files and you can kind of parse them in this format and you can, you know, they're time kind of based. Um, um, you know, that's what we do. Uh, but one, we want to store raw files, and many times, like li LiDAR data, data from cameras, uh, they don't lead themselves to that format very much. Um, so we have this system that we've been building for many years now. You can learn more about it uh, at cloud.ncsa down to the left. Um, that is basically focuses more on the raw files um, and metadata around these raw files. And it's heavily used in the MLCZO and TerraRef a use case which I'll mention briefly at the end um, to store uh, other types of information. Uh, so what can you do in Clouder? Well, you can upload, obviously, files and organize them, but there is really two items, bullet two and three, and maybe four, that are somewhat unique. Uh, we have a very generic way in which we store metadata on files and data sets, um, and we also have this automatic way of uh, triggering executions of arbitrary code on files and data sets when they're uploaded. Um, uh, we also have ways of writing visualizations for different file types. The bottom line is here is that Clutter is like a Dropbox, right? You can put any file there, but based on the file type, um, you can basically visualize it in different ways, and you can do some pre-processing on it in different ways, depending on what we have deployed. So what that means is that in practice, we have all these Clutter instances for all these use cases uh, running and customized for the different use cases. Um, and the type of data that gets stored in there. Um, so here is an example. Here's some medical information where we are identifying tumors. Um, here's geospatial information. Here's PDFs where we're identifying tables in PDFs and doing OCR. Here are P uh, PowerPoint slides for educational purposes. Uh, here are um, videos for social science analytics of uh, 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 using computer vision to track people on the playground and how they interact with each other. Uh, they were studying how kids interacted in the playground. This was an NSF uh, uh, project. Here's a 3D model, uh, archaeology, and you can actually kind of move the model around and you know, kind of look at it in the browser. <clears throat> so what does this look like for geospatial? Well, here's a flex tower data. Uh, so you can go to the geo dashboard and see the data uh, visualized at time series. But if you go to Clouder, you can see the raw files, and you can't see it very well at the bottom, but you got the raw files here. There's about 20,000 uh, right now uh, for this particular tower, but you also have other information about the tower, pictures from a visit in 2016, manuals about the tower. You have the data in different formats after it went you know, to different parcels, all stored in one place uh, that you can look at. Um, so, why Clouder? Well, also because there's this manual creation aspect. Once the files are in there and the data are defined, other users can add metadata. Uh, this metadata, and we have different widgets to do that. You can start typing in, you know, a location, and it will go to Google and try to do the geolocation for it, and then it will say, okay, here's the lat long for it. Uh, we have support for uh, control vocabularies. I'll add the slide in a second. Free text. There's all sorts of ways you can customize this. So here's control vocabularies where we're using some uh, very uh, popular in the US uh, control vocabularies. Uh, one is ODM2 and the other one is CSDMS. You configure these in Clouder and now when somebody goes in Clouder and wants to tag this file has water pressure as defined by CSD CSDMS, they can do that uh, if they want. Um, here's a quick slide about auto curation. When an image is uploaded to Clouder, if there are certain what we call extractors running, um, you might get metadata such as OCR. So on the left, you have a picture taken on the UIUC campus. On the right, you have metadata with that picture where an extractor did OCR and got some text out of that uh, image uh, for that particular picture. Down below, there is exif information from the picture within, you know, that is stored within the image. So you get a sense of how, how this is extensible, why this is powerful. For GIS, uh, that's how we support shapefiles and geotiffs. If you upload it to Clouder, then there's an extractor that takes that, recognizes it that it's of type geospatial. We use a geoserver, which is an open source uh, uh, software that we did not develop uh, that supports OGC formats and standards. 
we add metadata to Clutter as generic metadata, and then this metadata can be used to show that layer on the map, as well as using clients on your desktop, uh, like ArcGIS, um, to kind of uh, take that data and bring it to the desktop and you know, do whatever you want to do with it uh, within ArcGIS or QGIS. Yeah, this is a list of example extractors that we use. We have one for stitching um, uh, drone maps, uh, map, you know, images from drones over a field uh, using open source software such as Open Drone Map. We have a software that was written by researcher, researchers here at the um, University of Illinois to do tree delineation in LiDAR data. Uh, we have um, open source software that we not develop, but that we wrap for uh, extracting plant height, area, and color distribution for images of plants. Um, these are links at the bottom that have more comprehensive lists and also the source code for it. Um, so um, over the past couple of years at NCSA, we run a lot of these instances. Um, what we have is also in place a lot of code uh, where we have dockerized all these extractors and we can scale them up. So this graph shows extractions done at NCSA on one particular cluster for multiple projects since 2017. There's about 83 millions of them. Uh, it's very much um, kind of um, taken over by this TerraRef project that I'll mention in the next slide. Uh, but you can see down below IMLCZO, for example, in like fifth place or whatever. Um, so so we, have some, uh, we have some technology there in place to help us scale this stuff. So TerraRef, and uh, this is really my last slide, um, TerraRef is a project where it's very interesting because this is a collaboration, uh, I should have, uh, I, I missed, I, I didn't put it here, but this is a Department of Energy uh, project um, and a collaboration uh, with several universities across the United States. And what you see on the right is they have this robotic arm that they have a field in Arizona uh, that where this robotic arm every day goes down the field and takes, uh, has all these sensors on this robotic arm that take regular pictures of it, LiDAR, hyperspectral, all sorts of sensors in it that take measurements of plots within this long field. And they've been doing this uh, over the, I think it's year two. Um, they are up, you can see in Clouder, they have about a petabyte of data. And the interesting thing about this uh, project is that they're using Clouder for the raw files, but they're also using this Juice Streaming API but instead, they don't use the Geo dashboard. And in the Geo Streaming API, the way they're using it is they, for every plot, they basically index the data set in Clouder with, for example, you know, the hyperspectral picture uh, over time. So they say, this file in Clouder was taken at this time at this plot. And what I like about this is that it, show how it shows how this Geo Streaming API is very flexible with different use cases. So it doesn't have to be used in the way we use it in these other three projects that we show at the beginning. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so as a reminder, again, I think what I would like to kind of leave you with is this idea that when you're dealing with data from all these different sources, there's really not one size that fits them all. So what you do is you try to build these different services that focus on one aspect and you try to make them as generic as possible, and then you see how you can basically implement them for different use cases. And as you do that, you learn new things, and you kind of try to improve them and generalize them and apply them to uh, new use cases. So all this data is open source. Um, there is some information about the technology as the two links here, GeoDashboard and Clouder. Uh, and down below is the actual source for everything that we have described uh, in this presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Um, at this point, I think I'll take questions. And I think that's 40 minutes, like on the minute. So thank you very much for your time.